All right. So here's a few news articles. Um, so this I thought was very interesting, and I would sort of like to play with this. There's a new Android malware, which sounds like a rootkit or something even more amazing. You install an app that's infected with this thing. They don't really know how it gets on there. And then even when you remove the app, it's not gone. And even when you factory reset the phone, it puts itself back. It reinstalls itself, and they don't know how it works. So that sounds pretty exciting. A self-regenerating rootkit on Android, it would be fun to, to get a sample of that and figure out what it's doing. Um, it sounds like magic. There must be like a new persistence mechanism available, and that would be fun to learn about. Anyway, um, so there was this Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez grilled Mark Zuckerberg when he said he was not going to do fact-checking for political ads, although they do fact-checking for other ads. And she said, that means I could put up an ad with a blatant lie, and I could claim like a prominent Republican supports the Green New Deal. And he said, yeah, I guess you could. So this guy decided to run for governor of San Francisco just so he could put fake ads on Facebook because now he's a political candidate. So he declared himself a candidate, put fake ads, and Facebook took them down and said, you're not a real candidate. So now he thinks he's going to sue Facebook to force them to real, recognize his candidacy and make him, let him put fake ads on Facebook. So this is sort we of... We don't even have a governor. What's that? We don't have a governor. Oh, well... Uh, mayor... Uh, no, I think he's running for governor of California. Yeah, oh, Kelly. yeah, yeah. Anyway, he's um. So we'll see what comes of it all. It's kind of a fun political stunt, and uh, I was tempted to do the same thing when I heard that. Of course, I think Facebook might be right about this because the problem is people argue so much about politics. You can't even tell what the truth is. People say there's no global warming and cigarettes are good for you and stuff. And and when you try to say that's a lie, they bring a bunch of people and sue you and complain. And so I can feel like you probably don't even want to go there. But anyway. Uh, we will see how this all turns out. Well, I was wrong, but this guy is blatantly saying that he wants to run Facebook ads, so it's, it's not the same thing. Well, uh, I think the point is Facebook hasn't really written down their policy, and you can't decide. I mean. Um, besides now, who are they to say he's not a legitimate candidate? And he says, don't count me out. People might vote for me. Here's Facebook oppressing me, denying my candidacy. I mean, I think if you're going to stay out of it, you should stay out of it. We'll see what happens. But it's, um, anyway, so this I thought was very interesting. So NSO is an Israeli spyware group and they can hack into WhatsApp, which is end-to-end -end encrypted, and they do it by putting malware on the endpoint and catching the traffic before it's encrypted. And apparently this was used by oppressive regimes to attack a hundred human rights campaigners. So these guys are like the hacking team from I think France or Italy, where they appear to be developing exploits and then selling it to governments that are sort of shady, nasty governments who are then using it to do bad things. And it's not entirely clear if that's illegal. I mean that's a lot of companies do that celebrate can hack into any phone at any time, and they are very careful to only deal with real with police departments from, I think, fairly legitimate com countries, and they're quite picky about their client list because they don't want to get a bad reputation like this. The hacking team was the famous one that would just sell to anybody, and their stuff is being used by Iran and United Arab Emirates and all sorts of people that didn't seem to care who they trampled with it. And I think just like a, a arms dealer, I'm not sure what the laws are here. I mean, unless you have a... a group the one that uh, Snowden... Uh I'm not aware of a connection between Snowden and them, but maybe. I don't know much about the history of this group, but I know this is a big issue. Do you sell zero days? If so, who do you sell them to? Are you responsible for, for who uses them? What if they resell it? Uh, there's a huge argument about this, and it's very close to other forms of arms dealing. I think people have not decided what their laws are like and what the rules are like. And uh, anyway, it's, it's interesting stuff, and I think especially if they're doing it from another country. I don't really understand how you can sue and win. They're, anyway, they're, uh, Facebook is trying to sue them. WhatsApp is suing them. So we'll see what comes of that. And so the, this one is more kind of bad. So the Hong Kong government will not let a pro-democracy activist run for leader of the country because the official rules of Hong Kong government say you must always accept that China is, we are part of China. And he claims this, this sort of careful double talk, which has been the essence of all Hong Kong politics for the last 50 years, I think, is that technically I want us to have more rights here, but I'm not saying we shouldn't be part of China, so I should be allowed in. But anyway, it's um, 
it's a difficult needle to thread over there. You are not allowed to run unless you cooperate to some extent. And that's why there were all these careful statements. And there was a huge scandal when Trump got in office and he immediately uh, congratulated the president of Taiwan and China freaked out. There is no president of Taiwan. They're part of China. There's no separate country there. You promised to never say that, you rotten bums. And Trump is good at saying the one thing you're not supposed to say. So that's kind of his thing. Anyway, um, so this uh, Silicon Valley counter trend wants California to just take control of PG&E. It seems like maybe they should. I mean, PG&E is bankrupt. They're turning off the power. Their, their stuff is so broken, it's starting fires even though the power is turned off. And they don't seem to have any clue how they're going to pay for any of this or what they're going to do. So anyway, we'll see. Maybe just well, nationalizing. Be for the hedge funds to take over. Yeah. It's just nationalizing. It might be the move. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, we've had this ever since Enron for, for decades. We just had huge political disasters about power around here. And we just seem to lurch from one stupid problem to another. Um, and Pwned Own has been very famous. People would... Uh, attack computer systems and win them by showing the most exciting exploit. And, and uh, now they're going to do ICS hacking in Miami. So they're going to hack into industrial control systems. And uh, so it's, it's a theatrical event. Of course, the actual device you win is not worth much money. The point is the glory and the people that win this are then renowned as the most devastating hackers in the world. And people develop attacks all year to make sure they can take over machines. Yeah. yeah this year is past the San Francisco RSA. There was a workshop put on by, um, Company's name was Dragos, and they did industrial control systems. Yeah, and they never heard of Dragos from Pond to Home. Yeah, and we're going to um, a contest next in a week or two about this uh, Cyberforce competition, which is hacking these devices in Berkeley. So we'll be there. We got a team going to compete. So uh, we'll begin doing this IoT hacking. It's a really big thing, and uh, the cyber team is doing very well. So anyway, so let me talk about. Um, the kernel hacking. I've got this stuff all updated today and I'm happy with it. So it is this one. All right, so uh, I'm real happy with this. There, may, there were years ago when I found an IPv6 attack. Another guy had actually written this tool, but he hadn't developed the most powerful way to attack it. And I could take down Windows um, machines, Windows Server 2012 with a blue screen of death with IPv6 attacks. And people told me, why don't you just debug the kernel and find out why it's crashing? And I said, well, I don't know how to do that. And now I do. So anyway, this is what we're going to, we've already been debugging um, user land applications and with things like um, Ollie debug. And if you use win debug, win debug is an older, less friendly tool. It's almost a command line tool. It's one of these weird windows products that is really a command line tool, but they stick it in a window just to get in your way. Um, and, uh, anyway, it can be used to either way, but you must use win debug for the kernel. All the debug cannot debug the kernel. So, um, this, you have to understand Microsoft's windows structures. Now, fundamentally, the kernel is part of the hardware in the processor. There are operating system commands or assembly language commands, which can only be used in kernel mode. And most of the time you're running in user mode and you do not have direct access to them. And that is by design to make it safer for you to write software. So that even if your software has a bug, it can't crash the heart of the operating system and cause the machine to freeze. That's the idea. <clears throat> so the way you communicate with hardware is through device drivers. And this is of course, one of the weaknesses of windows. If you make a device like a printer or a NIC or something, then the person who manufactures it has to provide a driver and that driver has to run in kernel mode to touch the hardware. And therefore Microsoft's, the heart of the operating system includes code that Microsoft did not write. And often it's buggy and defective and causes the machine to crash and it's a problem. That's why Microsoft has a series of uh, defense measures to try to improve the code that goes in the kernel. And on server operating systems, they typically want will only let you put in drivers if those drivers have been signed and they would really like them to have passed Microsoft quality control testing um, where you have this label on the box that says designed for Windows XP, designed for Windows Vista or whatever it has. Anyway, so the driver um, loads in memory and stays in the kernel. Kernel's always loaded in RAM while you're running. It comes from a hard disk, but it's running in, whenever the machine is running, it's copied into RAM. And so if you want to access the driver, you access something called a device object, which is a software object which points to the driver. So in the Microsoft Windows terms, a device is not a piece of hardware. A device is a software object that's, that points indirectly to a piece of hardware. So a driver creates a device. So 
You might have, for example, two printers of the same brand. And then you'll use only one driver, but you will have two devices created, pointing to the, that was the software representation of printers, little printer icons on the screen. So if you plug in a flash drive, Windows creates the F device object. And the F is, of course, a virtual drive. There is no actual F on the thumb drive. That's just the label that Windows uses to point to it. And now you can read and write to the F drive, and it will then go through the driver in the kernel mode, which goes out the USB. And you can plug in a second flash drive. It will create another device called G, but it's probably still using the same driver if it's the same brand of thumb drive. So, all right. So DILs we talked about before. DILs are different than drivers, but they have some similarities. So DILs are library code that's loaded into a process. So the DILs export functions, which are ways to enter the library, and then uh, from that export table, when it first loads into memory, it calls DIL main, which prepares the DIL for use. And then all the functions that want to can connect to that DIL and use those library functions. Drivers are similar. <coughs> when you first do something like plug in a thumb drive, it will install a driver into the kernel, and the, when a driver is loaded, it calls its driver entry module, which is like domain in that regard. And that prepares these things called callback objects, which are analogous to those exports, uh, which lets you use it. So um, it def defines a callback object so other drivers can request information about the condition of this driver. And this is so hardware devices can decide if they have to wait for some other hardware device to be done before they do whatever they're trying to do. So DILs load into memory and run DIL main and then export things. Drivers load into the kernel, execute driver entry, and create callback functions and callback objects. They are now analogous activities, but they happen at a different level. All the DILs are in user land, and all the drivers are in kernel land. So um, that's the game. Drivers, instead of using export tables, they have these callback functions, and uh, that's what goes on here. They're used to... Uh, use the driver. So a normal read request, your user mode application does, uh, like in C, it does F equals open file name. That gives you a handle to the, the device. Uh, then it calls read file, and the kernel processes the read file request and calls the driver's callback function to do the I.O. into the kernel mode driver. So the most common thing you do for malware is device I.O. control. This is a generic request to mess with the driver. And the point is, Malicious kernel modules usually are not really pointing to any hardware. You don't really plug any hardware in the machine. You're putting in something like a root kit to give you something like remote control and a keylogger. So it pretends to be a driver to get in the kernel, and it doesn't actually run any code that points to an object. So they use this generic device I.O. control so it can send and receive data to the driver object uh, without having to bother um, having a real piece of hardware. So here's the structure. The stuff in the dash line is the kernel. The rest is user land. So your programming EXE is in user land. It calls kernel32.dil, which is not the kernel. It is the user land library that Microsoft wants you to use. And we talked about this before. <coughs> kernel32.dil is the normal Windows API. What Microsoft wants developers to do is use the modules in kernel32. NTDIL is the native API that is not supposed to be used by normal developers. You're supposed to go through kernel32 in the same way that if you want to mess with your Windows system, you're supposed to go through control panel. You're not supposed to open regedit and change registry keys one by one. That is, like, too dangerous. They expect you to just use the safe things in control panel, which then changes to registry. And they expect your developers to use kernel 32, which will then use NTDIL. But you can do an end run and call NTDIL directly, and that's the native API, something that malware does a lot and legitimate programs don't do so much. Then that goes to NTOS kernel, and that is the real kernel. It's an EXE file loaded when you boot up the machine, and that's in kernel land. And that is the heart of the operating system that Microsoft wrote. And there are these drivers, which came typically from other people, unless Microsoft built the hardware. And the various drivers are loaded, depending on what your hardware is. And those drivers have kernel data structure, and all these drivers then send signals to the hardware. Um, this is why you know Windows is big and bloated. It has thousands of drivers included. <coughs> and there are people who like other systems like Arch Linux. Arch Linux will take like 36 hours to compile on your machine because it doesn't include any drivers except the ones that are really on your hardware. And therefore, it doesn't waste a lot of RAM and space. People say it's faster. But if you change any hardware, you have to recompile it. And that's uh, Microsoft is the opposite. It's a big, bloated, general-purpose operating system. So it has thousands of drivers, which you're only using a few, and they don't care. 
It's just supposed to be easier to use and easier to install and such. Yeah. Didn't uh, Microsoft used to have, or Windows now used to have a hardware compatibility list? Yes. And so it doesn't, it doesn't that <coughs> No, they still do. Software. No, there's a hardware compatibility list for each version of Windows, which tells you which hardware is known to be compatible with Windows, which means they know of a driver and it'll work. And therefore, the point of that is if you have uh, existing hardware and you want to upgrade to the next version of Windows, you can run this tool and it'll tell you if any of your hardware is not going to work on the new version. That's the idea. And of course, that changes with time as manufacturers write more drivers and stuff, but mostly that's it. Yeah, Microsoft still has that feature. So um, anyway, like I say, some kernel mode malware has no user mode component. You know, the malware doesn't really participate in this whole process of accomplishing anything. It just tries to look like a driver to get in the kernel, and it may not have a user mode component to get there because you're not really supposed to open a handle to it from user land and use it like a device. It's just there to trick the operating system into running some code. So NTOS kernel is the core OS functions. HAL.dil is the hardware abstraction layer. Um, this is a little bit like virtual machines, but it was long before virtual machines. Uh, you have to have the hardware abstraction layer for your motherboard. It's, some, it's uh, sort of like a driver, something used to control the hardware. And one of the fundamental files that has to be there when you boot up your machine. Anyway, so malware will import functions from one or both of these files to use in the kernel. And I've got some cahoots. So they should be here. And it looks good. 10A in the right class is here. Okay. And good, that looks all right. All right. Got a wrong note there. <coughs> it's for Halloween. Yeah. And little pumpkins. All right. Guess we got a few more coming. I'll give it a few more seconds. Yeah, it always says that. Doesn't seem to matter. Something about the City College Network it doesn't like. All right, let's do it. So, what is it an application interacts with? It goes to a device, which is a user land software object pointing ultimately to the kernel and a driver in the hardware. That's Microsoft Lingo. What code is loaded into a process? <coughs> okay, those are DILs, dynamic link libraries. All right. When a driver is loaded, what procedure is first called? Driver entry, that's the, what's automatically run when a driver is loaded. All right, which one of these runs in user mode? Kernel, this is the general rule for Microsoft names is everything is always named the opposite of what it is. So kernel does not run in kernel mode. That rule will solve you, will help you move most Microsoft products. And Hino and Kentan and WITB. 
which is Eli, I think. All right. So, um, all right, let's go back to here and talk more about kernels. So, if you want to debug the kernel, um, in the old days, you would have to have two physical machines connected with a serial cable, not a USB cable, but the old-fashioned serial cable, which almost none of them have anymore, because if you were to, say, put a breakpoint in the kernel and stop the kernel, the machine would stop dead, not responding to the mouse or the keyboard or anything. So you can't have one machine and forget stop the kernel. You have to have a second machine, a master, and a slave, and the master will control it through the serial cable, and now you can stop the slave and inspect it and restart it from the master. That was the old system. And I used to have in this class years ago, we would actually do this in VMware. You can configure a virtual serial port and connect from one virtual machine to another. And it was very difficult to set up and very unreliable. And the students had great suffering. And uh, it was very annoying. Anyway, <coughs> in, another thing you have to do is when you're debugging a Windows system, you have to change the boot up sequence to tell it that I want debugging turned on. Otherwise, it does not have the ability to break and stop the kernel, which is not something you want to do under normal conditions. So the old way in Windows XP used to change the boot.ini, which was a text file, used to start up the machine. But since Windows Vista, all modern versions of Windows use this binary configuration system in B, using BCD edit instead. <coughs> so you do BCD edit slash debug on, and that will um, set your machine to turn on kernel debugging. So you, um, all right. Now you have to install WinDebug, and you can just download it from Windows Debugging Tools. They have it for every version. And I've um, made two, so you just download software, you download a bunch of, you can get the software development kit, but the only thing you need is the debugging tools, which aren't that big for this. And so I made two projects. The older one is the 2008 server. If people are still using that old 2008 server, you can use it, although I think it's time to just knock it off. 2008 server is near the end of its life, and who cares? This is 32-bit. And I just got this working today, 64-bit debugging on a Windows 2016 machine. So that is definitely, in my opinion, the better thing to do. But you can do either one of these. Um, and I'll, I'll show you the 2016 one. But I certainly would not waste your time on 2008 unless you have some kind of serious problem getting a Google Cloud or installing 2016. Even if you're using VMware, you can still install a local 2016 server. And I would do that rather than waste your time on 2008. But you can get points either way. Anyway, this is glorious wind debug. Um, there was, I think this all dates from like Windows 3.1 when Microsoft was imperfectly trying to transition to a graphical operating system from MS-DOS. So they invented these weird things that look like Windows but aren't really, where you only can type in something at the bottom line and it goes in here. And this seems to date from that era from the GUI. But anyway, it is the standard. Let's see a question here. When is server 2008's end of life? You know, it's a good question and I don't really know, but I think it's pretty soon. I think it came out with Vista. I think Vista's hit the end of life. I think Windows 7 is already hitting the end of life. So it might, or I think Windows 2008 has already hit the end of life, but Windows 2008 R2 might have a year or so left. I'm not sure. It's a good question, and I don't know. But uh, anyway, 32 bit OSs in 2008 are pretty much relics, and I would recommend ignoring them and moving on to the 64 bit 2016. So anyway, a windy bug is basically a command line uh, tool. You do not get to choose things from a menu except things that don't work very well. So you have to learn some commands. So D <coughs> will read, you can do DA to display ASCII text, DU to display Unicode, DD to display double words like we do in um, GDB in the exploit development class. So you can do DA at an address and it'll then show the ASCII text starting at that address. You can edit memory. Although you can't do this, well, I think you, can, you might be able to do this. I don't think you can do this with the live KD we're going to use, but you can, in principle, edit memory if you really have two machines and they're connected together and you're doing kernel debugging, then you can write to memory. Um, you can use plus and minus and division and all that jazz. And you can use DWO to show the location at a pointer. Um, this is like load effective address in assembly code. And you can set breakpoints. If you do have two physical machines connected with a serial table or a virtual imitation of that, so then you can set breakpoints and use go to resume running, set a breakpoint at this process, um, print out the second argument, and so on, so it will stop when it hits a certain function, print things out, and then wait. And that's what you might do if you are writing your own device driver and you're trying to debug your device driver, you'll have to put breakpoints in the kernel and really have two machines. 
but we're going to use Live KD. Live KD is a Mark Rusinovich tool, and what this does is it does not let you debug the live running kernel. It runs a, it makes a crash dump. Now the crash dump will dump the memory of the kernel into a file. It generates a crash dump and then lets you look at that file as if it was the running kernel, so you can inspect the kernel and see how it works, but you're not really messing with a live kernel. So the huge advantage, of course, you can run it on just one machine, you don't need a serial cable or anything. The only disadvantage is it's not really live. It's like a static picture of the kernel, but it's still good enough to do quite a lot of interesting stuff. So you can do LM to list modules. That will load all the modules. And LM, you can, M disk will show the disk driver. You'll see this thing called disk and then a list of symbols. Um, if you don't have any symbols, then the only thing you'll get is hexadecimal addresses for everything. But if you load symbols, then known Microsoft objects, like Harsh's parts of NTOS kernel and known Microsoft drivers will instead have alphanumeric names, which are a lot easier to read. So <coughs> WinDebug will vigorously try to encourage you to download symbols appropriate to your version of Windows when you load it, because it'll be much easier to use in that way. So you can read from memory with uh, DD will show memory and you can show um, modules. So let's play a bit with this stuff and I'll just go to the project that you're gonna do and demonstrate some of it. So here is 126 and I'm gonna go to the um, cloud-based 410C. There's two projects, 410 and 410C. 410 is the old 2008 which I wouldn't do unless you have some great desire to use 2008, I would use 410C. I just made a fresh Windows 2016 virtual machine. By the way, you can make a lot of them like I have. The only trick is you have to put them in different locations. There's some kind of rule like you can only have 16 cores in one location, so I put them all over the place. The one I made today is this one, I put it in Europe West. Europe, there's like 16 locations, Europe West, Asia East, Asia South. Just choose a different location for each Windows machine you make and it will work. So this practical malware analysis one is here in my remote desktop session and I'm running a VPN because City College blocks RDP. So you cannot connect directly, you cannot use remote desktop protocol to control Windows machines directly on the, Microsoft, on the City College network, but what you can do is run a VPN client. And I'm using Viper VPN, it's just, there's a bunch of them, it works. Um, you could also use Danger Zone in these labs, but I'm using Viper VPN, and therefore I can now use Remote Desktop Protocol. So I'm connecting, and uh, I gave it a name and password that I got from Google Cloud, so now I'm in, and here's glorious um, Windy Bug. So I'm just gonna stop it and come back. Okay, so um, I'm gonna say no for now. All right, so what I had to do was I had to download Windy um, Live. First, I had to install those Windows debugging tools from just a Microsoft link like I showed you. And then I had to download this thing called Live KD, which is a little Mark Rusinovich tool. Like all Mark Rusinovich's tools, it's just one zip file. And when you unzip it, it's just two executables and a license agreement, a 32 and 64 bit version. So I put the 64 bit version in C Windows system so I could run it without giving the whole path. And now I can just run it here. So it's Live KD.exe minus W. There are other switches, I've never used them. Minus W is the one that does a kernel dump of the kernel right now and opens it in WinDebug, which is the only thing I needed to do. Now, like I said, it's going to go to the Microsoft symbol server on the internet and download the symbols for my version of Windows so it can give me alphabetic ing. so I want it to do that automatically. And I'll just let it put those symbols in C symbols. I don't know why it doesn't leave them there and know they're there, it seems to have to re-download them each time but it's fast enough that I don't really care. So here we are, it has loaded user symbols. So it's ready. Now I could, um, this is why I don't know what the deal is. There's this gray window that does nothing. There's this little window you need to use, so I maximize it. And I don't know why it isn't just a command line tool anyway. So now we can do things like LM to load modules. And this will show me all the currently loaded kernel modules, which are mostly drivers and such. And see, since it loaded symbols, I have names for them. Most, and here's one that has a long name. This is NT kernel map. This is NT, Windows NT. Um, all right, so that's the kernel. And, uh, oh, here's NT dill. I see, I mixed up something in my instructions. NT is down here. I thought NT and NT dill were the same, but they aren't. Anyway, there's NT. So NT is the kernel itself. 
So we can play some games with NT, and let me just go down here and let's, there's how you load the, uh, then you turn on debugging, then you get live KD and you run it. And one thing that's annoying is that a live KD can't load the debugger until you manually adjust the path to point to it, so I put that here. Anyway, um, there's always little problems. Um, and so when you get down here, we can view processes. Now, if I do bang process here, uh, let me get to my window, which is here. And to make it easier, I need to make it less than full screen. All right. So let me make this like that. All right, that'll do. So if I do um, bang process, It will show me information about the current foreground process, which is um, windy bug. So if I scroll up here, it'll tell me um, this process has a CID of FF4. Now FF4, we can figure out what that is. FF4 is hexadecimal, so that is 15 times 256 plus 15 times 16, plus four. So um, I guess I'll just use a calculator. All right, so if I use base 10 and I take 15 times 256, plus 15 times 16, plus four, I get 4,084. And just so you can see what's going on here, that is the same information I could get from Task Manager. If I go here to the more familiar Windows tool, Task Manager, this shows you information about running tasks. And if you go to Details, you can find um, WinDebug here, and it is number 4084. That's its process ID, and that's what this is. CID is the same thing in hexadecimal. So this is just giving you the same kind of information I would have gotten from Task Manager. Now, Task Manager shows you all the running processes, and this can show you all the running processes too, if you give it the right command, and that's not bang process, but bang process zero, zero. That will give you all the running processes, and there they are with a little information about each one, and it tells you where the process environment block is and other things like handles and such. That's just a list of currently running processes. Now, that's not terribly useful right now, but it is sort of nice to see that you're seeing the same kind of information that the graphical Windows tools will give you. And the point is, you have graphical tools like Task Manager and Resource Monitor that give you some information, and if you want more detailed information, you use WinDebug to get the whole story. So there's help. The dot .help tells you almost nothing, except it tells you to use .hh. .hh, this is an internal issue of Microsoft's system, Microsoft has a bunch of old legacy teams that use old tools, and they go on forever, often contradicting others. So .hh is the actual help that's worth something, and it is Windows 3.1 style chum files, old 16-bit help stuff. Um, yeah. Is that uh, more comprehensive than Proc Explorer or Proc Monitor? Yes. Process Explorer and Process Monitor are much simpler tools that only give you some information. This gives you the entire access to the code. So yeah, Process Explorer and Process Monitor are just beefed up task managers, which give you summary. This gives you all the information. You can totally figure out exactly how Windows works with this tool. And that's why when Microsoft has like secret um, functions and such, they're fooling themselves because you can use WinDebug to figure out everything that's happening. You can see at the assembly language level, everything in Windows. And so if you learn how to read assembly language, which is not that difficult, then you can find out everything in Windows. That's why it is kind of funny, you know, Windows, they make a big deal about Windows being closed source. Uh, and you know, I don't, that's the reverse engineering is such a big deal. I mean, it is closed source, but going into a closed source product is really not that hard. After you learn to do a little bit of assembler and stuff, um, you can work from compiled code. And if you do malware analysis, that's one big case where you have to. So here's the help file. And this is actually how you learn to use WinDebug. This is very good. This will give you details about how to do everything. And it's really very nice. This is where I go to learn how to use the commands. And like all these debuggers, they have hundreds of complicated commands. And I only know like three or four common commands to do simple things. And that's highly what I recommend. 
Um, unless you want to take a whole course in this one product, you want to learn just a few things to get a start of it. And that's all we're going to do here. So um, let's play a few games with WinDebug. We can list modules with LM. We saw all them. Now we can find specific modules. Now we looked at LM and we found NT. I've got to fix this picture. This is NT Dill. NT is off my screen. But um, anyway, NT is the kernel. And so it's actually called NTOS kernel.exe, but for short, they call it NT. And so um, you can view memory. So let's take a look at memory. DD will look at memory in um, hex. So I'm going to do DD NT. And it shows me the start of NT in just 32-bit um, words. So these are four bytes. Each byte is two hexadecimal characters, and off you go. So we've got a bunch of zeros and other things. Here's a header. Here's some code-looking stuff. So that's the viewing memory in raw hexadecimal. Now, you could display it as ASCII, and if you do, it has MZ, and then it has a null terminator. So this string only is three letters, and then it terminates, and that's where it stops. MZ dot MZ dot is what all Windows executables have. That is their file header. MZ stands for, I don't know what, but it is what starts all Windows executables. Um, so that's the ASCII. You can just play both, DB, and it will show you both hex and ASCII, sort of like Wireshark would. You've got bytes here one by one and a dash in the middle at the eighth one, so the first eight on the left, the next eight on the right, and over here you have ASCII characters, if it's readable, and if it's unreadable, it just puts a dot. So you see the same thing. Every Microsoft program starts with MZ, and then it has this program cannot be run in DOS mode, and that's how it goes. All right, you can then examine symbols, which is more interesting. So if I look at X, NT star, NT, um, I'm not going to let, this takes like two minutes to go. If I do this, NT bang star, that will give me all the symbols that start with NT. And that is going to be every function in the kernel, every API call in the kernel. And there are thousands of them. So it looks like this quantum control halt device, release duplicate info, and so on. There are thousands and thousands of them scrolling by. I'm not going to do it because it's too slow. I'm going to move up to these ones that limit it. You can use wildcards and look for certain kinds of functions. So I can do NT bang create star. I think I can use copy and paste. Copy and paste into a virtual machine is a little unreliable, but it works pretty well. Okay, so now I'm going to get the kernel functions that have the word create in the middle of it and have anything before and after it. And those, there are a few pages on them, but it's not 10,000. So you see I have create file, create event queue, create security descriptor, and so on. These are the Windows API calls that do things. And every code you write in Windows user land is just a bunch of calls to all these Windows functions. Open a window, go to the printer, pop up a box, read the keyboard, all this jazz. So uh, now if I want to create a file, I could find the functions that do create file. So I put file in here, and now there's only about 10 of them. So there's various ways to create a file, NT create file, ZV create file, verifier NT create file. These are various ways to create a file. So the simplest one is NT create file itself, and I can view that function. Now I can unassemble that function. So I can unassemble NT bang, NT create file, I don't think capitalization matters, but Microsoft's convention is to capitalize the first letter of each word. So this will show me the start of that function. And because it's 64-bit code, I see um, addresses here that are long and start with Fs and then have a lower part of the address down here. And I think it's put a dot in the middle to separate the left 32 bits and right 32 bits is what it looks like. I'm just guessing, but that's what it looks like to me. Here is the instruction in hexadecimal, and here is the meaning, and I can tell it's 64-bit code because the registers are RSP. RSP is the 64-bit register. Now, here's a 32-bit command. You can refer to 32-bit registers in 64-bit mode, and that's what it does, EAX to EAX. as a short command. You can mix 32 and 64-bit instructions. Just so I'm so here it is moving Q value and so on. So here's functions going by. Um, subtract XOR and then move, move, move. That's the beginning of it. Now you can see the whole function. You can use the disassembly window, and this is where I continue having my bad attitude about this GUI. There's a thing called disassembly. 
you can load this window, and what you get is some sort of horrible mixture between a command line and a GUI that doesn't really do either of the things very well. So you can put a label up here to go someplace, and the label to put up there is ntbang ntcreate file. So ntbang ntcreate file. And when you put it up there, it finds that location and puts it here. But there's no scroll bar, and it's hard to move around. As far as I can tell, the only way you can move around is to click in here and now move up and down with the arrow keys and wait for it to scroll, and it will scroll in an irritating way, jumping stuff off the screen. So if you play with the size of the window and scroll back and forth, you can eventually trick it into showing you the function, but it's very clumsy. And I don't know why they give me a window and they don't give me a scroll bar. They just generally irritate me. But it is possible to highlight this function, and you can see what I've been saying. This is the entire function. That's open file. Well, here's NT create file. I still don't have it on screen at once. I'm hoping to. Let me try now. Um, it looks like I'm again failing in getting it to fit on the screen well. Um, I think if I keep adjusting the size of things, I can eventually find some combination of values that will actually let me see the whole function on screen at once. And there, okay, I may not be able to do it in my live demo because of this ridiculous um, environment I'm working in. There, I finally succeeded after about six tries in getting the whole NT create file function on the screen at once. And here's the return, and then it has break, 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 which kind of surprises me. That's what I put in this area of code you're not supposed to use. They filled it with breaks. That is the whole function called NT create file. And what it does is just move some parameters around to prepare something and then call NTIOP create file. So this is generally the case. There is some low level utility that does the work and there's a friendlier version that just rearranges the parameter and uses the low level utility. Um, anyway, so like I say, it's not that difficult. It's not that complicated. You could figure out what's going on in the Windows kernel by just looking at these functions. And that's why they can't really hide anything from you for too long. And that's true of all reverse engineering. People think their code is secret. You can't get the source code. And it doesn't mean you can't figure it out. It just means you have to learn to do this. And this is not rocket science. It's not impossible. And mm -hmm. all right. Anyway, that's, that's why it's worth learning a little of this and seeing demystifying it. So you can look at the structure of driver objects. So let's take a look at this. This will view a structure in memory. So I'm going to get rid of this irritating disassembly window and get back to the slightly less irritating window here and try control V. And it looks like it did work there. So this will display NT driver object and it'll display type. So this is a data structure. And so here it is. Um, the driver object is a C++ data structure sort of thing. So it's got a integer and an integer and then a pointer, 64 bit pointer to the object. And then it's got a Unicode string, which is the driver name and so on. So this is the structure of it. You can see the, the data structure of a thing called a driver object. And um, that's a game there. So anyway, then to get your points, you have to find a function with a name with registry in the middle of it. And you have to disassemble this NT shutdown system. In, pre in the 32-bit system, I had people disassemble beep. And as far as I can tell, beep is finally gone in 64-bit windows. Beep is what used to do, control G used to beep in MS-DOS, in like 16-bit MS-DOS. And it's... It was not a nice simple function. Anyway, so I did shut down system. Anyway, shut down system is another simple routine. That's the whole thing. Not much to it. Not too hard to find. Anyway, so that's a little bit of kernel debugging. And let me get back to my slides. And there's probably some cahoots or something to look at. So we talked about this. Um, that's how you read from memory. And you can look at the start of NT. You can the online help. The HH is the friendliest help. Uh, you can dump registers if you want to. And you'll see the 64-bit registers. And uh, so that's the start of a little introduction to Windy Bug. And I've got 10B cahoots, I think. Not 10C, 10B, all right. In this class right here, okay.
Mm -hmm. All right, I'll give it about five more seconds. So, how do you set a breakpoint in Windy Bucket? Obviously, PP, all right? Not that I've ever done it, but that's how you do it. All right. So, if you want to show memory as ASCII, what do you do? TA, of course, good. How about showing all kernel drivers? LM lists all modules, and those include all the drivers. And if you want to change memory contents, which one will do that? Ed is edit. All right, simple enough stuff. I've got Ken Tan here twice and Rich and Vin. All right, so let's just take a look at the last bit here. So, Microsoft symbols, we talked about these. Microsoft symbols are what you refer to things like NT and NT create file and those things. Um, so you can have names like this, create process address space, instead of having to find the hexadecimal address for everything, which would make it much more difficult to figure out what's going on. So now you can do module name, bang, symbol name, and you can refer to um, any named object. So module names are like the exe, del, or sys, file name, and the symbol name is a name. So NTOS kernel has a shortcut called NT, so NT, bang, NT, create process is the label with NT create process name inside NT, and that is an entry point where you can run that function. All right, so there's various ones to do, you can do create process and so on, and you can list different parts of it you, in this window. Um, if you want to, instead of having to, um, instead of having to put it in that irritating unassembly window, which I don't like much, you can just leave it all here. So I can do, let me bring this up, okay, unassemble. Um, NT create process, so it's unassemble, NT bang, NT create process. And if I do that, it unassembles it, but it only unassembles, like, looks like about the first eight commands or something. And if I want to do more, I can use L10 and L20 to say how many lines to do. So let's try that. Up arrow will repeat the previous command, and I can add an L10 to it. And I figured this out, of course, by using .hh to find the format. So now I get 10 somethings. I'm not quite sure what I'm getting, 10 64-bit words or something. And I can do more with L20. And now I get even more. So this is what I would do instead of messing around with that irritating disassembly window. This will now let me see, and you can see now I've got the whole function, right down to the return, and then the int three. So by doing L20, I was able to get the whole thing in this window under more control. And as far as I can tell, it should just be a command prompt window, and it would be even easier to control. Anyway, um, all right. So uh, you can make breakpoints, and it has all the advanced features of debuggers. You can have deferred breakpoints that will only set this later under certain conditions. You got a function that will find the entry point of a module, so you can break at the entry point of this module, so that when it tries to load that module, it'll stop as soon as that module loads, and that's of course important if you, for example, are writing that because it's a kernel driver that you're writing, and you want to break as soon as it enters your driver, and then examine step by step as the code flows through to figure out what the problems are with your driver. So you can search with X. This will search for everything with create process in the middle of it. And uh, you can find the closest symbol with LN. That will find the closest symbol to a point. So this again helps you find things if you're getting lost. If it's crashing somewhere and you can't, you don't know what's going on, you can look for symbols near there and they may be helpful to help you understand what module you're in and what process is going on. 
You can view structure information with DT, like we looked at the structure of a driver object, and you can look at other ones. Um, so here it's looking at a driver object. This is the whole thing, and so it's got um, the name is a Unicode string and so on. We've seen that. Um, and so there's, there's driver objects and device objects. Let's take them and compare them. So DT driver object should be up here. In my, there we are. Here's driver object going down to there. And let's do device object instead, which is here. All right, and you can see the device object is quite a bit bigger. And it's got a device extension, a device type, and stack size, and active thread count, and so on. And the device is a different thing than a driver. Anyway, so that's uh, how they look. Here's the beep driver, which I was able to look at before. Um, specific value for the beep driver. I was able to do NT driver object, and then you give the address of the beep object, and it will now show you the template for the structure and the specific values being used for that instance of the object. So you can examine how that object's being used by just one function. The driver init function is called when a driver is loaded, and uh, you can see that here. There's a driver init line here that's a pointer to the location, and that's beep driver entry plus zero. Just uh, so that's the code that automatically runs when it loads, and therefore, if you're making a malicious driver, you would often just put your malicious activity there, and then you don't actually have to call it. You just have to load it, and it will automatically run the malware. Just like if you're making a malicious dill, you put the evil in dill main, so it'll just happen as soon as you load the dill. Um, all right, you got um, Windows symbols. If your machine is on connected to the internet like mine, you'd probably find or just download them as you need them. If you want to work offline, then you can download them and cache them locally somewhere and refer to them with a command, and then you can uh, load symbols locally. Uh, I don't know if this is still necessary, but there are people that work in machines that are not connected to the internet. You can manually download them too. There, you need to get the right symbols for your exact version of Windows, including the service pack and everything. So it's, it's, there's quite a library of them online. Um, all right. And we're down to the last Kahoot. And that is 10C. All right. <clears throat> All right. Five seconds. All right. So, which one will set a breakpoint? That one there will set a breakpoint at the starting entry for the fast fat routine, which I think is something that loads a FAT32 file system, although I'm not really quite sure. Anyway, all right. Which one shows the type information for a structure? Okay, that's DT, display type for something. All right, and which one will list all the functions in NTOS kernel.exe?
It's the first one there. We did it before. XNT Bang Star will show you all the uh, API calls that go into the kernel. And that is the whole heart of the Windows operating system. And looks like there's about a thousand of them, but it's not an impossible number. And people do gradually figure it out. Um, Apple until recently locked everybody out completely. And the only way in was to get a special unlocked Apple phone, which they kept physically secure. And they just announced about a month ago that they were going to the first time ever provide unlocked phones from internal Apple to certain uh, Apple security analysts outside the company. But that was completely scooped by um, Axiom 8 the hacker who two or three weeks ago announced a jailbreak that breaks through the hardware boot ROM in every Apple phone except the latest version, like all the ones we used for like last 10 years. So that means everybody can break into the operating system on their phone now and Apple can never patch it because it's a flaw in the hardware. So it totally blew away Apple's security model. And that was the big difference between Apple and Windows. You see Microsoft doesn't distribute the source code, but you can pretty easily look at it and figure it out. Apple tries to make that very, very difficult. They lock you in so you cannot install anything except the apps that come from the store. They don't give you any tools like WinDebug, so you can't look at the kernel, and they have cryptographic limits when it loads, so you can't even load the kernel in a form that lets you add more tools. So they really lock you out vigorously, and that was just blown away. That's why this Axiom 8 guy is really the talk of the town. Um, he's, he's considered the most significant security exploit ever found in Apple. And um, that makes it possible for everyone to look inside Apple the same way. And Apple is, I think, just beginning to totally freak out about this. Uh, you, what, their argument will probably be that he destroyed Apple security by exposing their top secret OS and people can find bugs in it. The open source researchers will say, great, now we can find the bugs and develop attacks and develop modified tools and modified versions of Apple devices and do all the hacking we want to do. And uh, the researchers feel like they're improving security. Apple probably feels like they ruin everything, and there'll be arguments and yelling and blaming going back and forth. But anyway, they catch out of the bag. So, uh, all right. Well, I guess that's it for this stuff. Uh, so you should definitely do the kernel project. There's going to be another kernel project coming after this one where you um, look at SSDT hooking, which is how rootkits work, and we'll talk about that next time. I've got the project for 2008, but I have to work on updating it for 2016. Um, so I hope to have that working by next week. And um, does anybody have any questions? It's online, I'll see if there's a chat coming in. Other than that, I'm just gonna stop it. I'll stick around for a while to help anybody that wants to work here. And uh, if you're not gonna do that, I will see you next week. Farewell. Well, the midterm grades are out. I put them on the, uh, the online Canvas system, and the college will send them to you however they do that pretty soon. All right.